I think you see him, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Ms. Elatore. Welcome back, everyone. Um, the, this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is now returned from closed session discussion. The board did not take any votes or actions during the closed session. With that, we will move to agenda item number four, which is an update from our executive director, Ashkan Sultani. Mr. Sultani, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Wonderful. Um, well, good, good afternoon. It's nice to be all back together finally uh, in public. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to give the board an update. And first wanted to express my gratitude to DCA for the presentation this morning. So since we last met in October, or in November, sorry, um, I've been focused on primarily on two key tasks building out the agency and preparing us up for the upcoming rulemaking. To follow the analogy from the presentation this morning, we're building the car while we drive it. Uh, so I'm trying to do both. Um, starting with the agency, I've been building on the work that the startup subcommittee uh, did in advance of my joining to set up key procedures and processes for HR, IT, contracting, and finance. So as you know, uh, Vaughn, our Deputy Director of Administration, joined in December. She's done an incredible job developing smoothing out procedures to help us build out more efficiently. Um, I'm also thankful for all the help from BCSH in facilitating our relationships with our control agency or control organizations. We made great improvements in process thanks to them. We thankfully now have key hiring and onboarding procedures in place and are developing our organizational policies for staff with the help of the startup community. Additionally, while we're continuing to maximize telework per the executive order following the pandemic, we entered a 12 month sublease agreement with one of our sister, sister agencies, the FPI for office space. So our agreement is currently for the Sacramento office, but the FPI has offices across California. So there might be an opportunity to expand our physical presence as we grow. And for hiring, so in addition to policies and procedures, we've hired some additional support staff. With Vaughn's help again, we've brought on two AGPAs and a law clerk to help us with the rulemaking. We intend to continue to bring on additional support staff in the coming weeks. And we've also thankfully brought on additional resources from DOJ, which I'm very excited about. Um, we're also currently uh, interviewing for our HR liaison uh, and that person once on board should dramatically accelerate the speed by which we can hire since they can manage our interaction with DGS and Cal HR and other control agencies. Um, finally, we advertise for two senior CEA positions, our uh, Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation and our Deputy Director of Public Affairs. And so I do ask the public and the board to share these roles public, uh, pretty widely if they are willing. Um, as you know, there, these are crucial roles to the agency. We have already a number of legislative proposals which impact our agency that we'll want to engage on. And additionally, and importantly, our statute directs us to perform three core functions, rulemaking, enforcement, and public awareness. And so the public, uh, the uh, Deputy Director of Public Affairs will oversee this critical role, not just of communications, but our outreach and awareness and education function to help Californians realize their rights and operationalize the privacy rights that are afforded under the statute. Um, following these uh, hiring of these positions, my next priority is to begin recruiting for additional attorney positions, as well as key admin staff, such as IT and finance to help prepare us as we, we grow as an organization. Finally, as part of my onboarding, I also had the opportunity to meet with the administration and legislature, including leadership staff, and the relevant ju jurisdictional policy committees in both houses and both parties. I also had the opportunity to meet with a number of national and international counterparts, including delegates from the EU, other EU enforcement agencies, and the National Association of AGs. And I think those help uh, inform our, our, our org as we grow. Now, an update on our budget. So as you know, our $10 million appropriation prov is provided for in statute. However, we're still required to create a budget chain proposal to outlaw in our expenditure moving forward. Uh, in November, I prepared a BCP, budget chain proposal, 
which was approved by the administration and included in the governor's budget, which is now uh, in the hands of the legislature to approve. Just this week, the Senate Budget Subcommittee scheduled our routine appearance to present our proposal, which is set for March 2nd. In our budget, we requested 34 positions, which isn't our full complement of positions, but it's a necessary start. Also, as I outlined in our intention to focus and pursue remote telework, uh, focusing on rulemaking and focusing on public uh, awareness and education, the budget reflects those goals in, uh, kind of in, in, in the staffing. Once the budget is approved, hiring should move forward pretty quickly, uh, or not pretty quickly, but more quickly, as it eliminates the need to establish to administratively establish every position as we do now. I'll plan to report on where we are in the budget later this year. And then finally, our uh, the rulemaking process update, um, information hearings and timeline. So as you know, on October 21st of last year, we gave notice to the AG uh, that we are prepared to uh, assume rulemaking. Last month, the Attorney General also filed a non-substantive Section 100 change to move the existing CCPA, reg sorry, uh, CCPA regulations into a new section designated for the CPPA. Note the amendment merely reorders and renumbers the existing regulation. There's no, and it does not materially alter the law. Also in January, we gave notice to the Office of Administrative Law and the Department of Finance of our intended rulemaking calendar including the possibility that we may introduce major regulation, which we will need to analyze. Moving forward, we will continue with preliminary proceedings in March, April, with a set of uh, informational hearings. In March, I'm in the process of organizing a set of instructive sessions, inviting experts and academics to help inform the agency on questions related to the topics we're exploring and rulemaking. The final dates are being scheduled, but likely mid to late March for those uh, instructive sessions. Then in April, I intend to organize a set of preliminary public sessions to receive further input from stakeholders on our rulemaking. We'll plan to announce a process for, for stakeholders to sign up and participate in advance of those sessions. Moving to rulemaking, as I mentioned, the agency's rulemaking authority takes, into effect, takes effect in April. With the information gathered from the preliminary work we can then expect formal proceedings for a formal rulemaking package after our 30 is in place in Q2. Formal proceedings, including public hearings, will then continue into Q3 with rulemaking completed in Q3 or Q4. While this timeline does put us somewhat past the July 1 rulemaking schedule in statute, it allows us to balance staffing up the agency while undertaking substantial preliminary information gathering to support our rules. Staff is currently working with input from the respective subcommittees in order to develop draft rules and further identify what items we might be able to include in our initial package. And with that, Chairperson, would it be okay to pause here for questions? Absolutely, um, Mr. Sultani. Thank you very much for that thorough and efficient update. Um, and thank you. I expect that the process subcommittee, excuse me, the rulemaking process subcommittee helped inform the last part of um, information that you gave to us. And I wanted to say that I really appreciate um, all the work um, going into that. And I especially appreciate the attention given to preliminary information gathering. It will be no surprise to any of you because you've heard me say it before that I think that this is really an important part of our um, task. Of course, we do have a tight timeline and we have to balance these things, but having the comments from the invitation for comment that the regulation subcommittee put together has already been very, very helpful to my own thinking and I expect to other members of the board. And I think that these informational hearings will also be incredibly important to our ability to put together the best set of regulations. So I really appreciate this and I support the, um, the estimated timeline that has been set out. Uh, are there any other comments or questions from the board? Mr. Lay. 
Yeah, I just want to uh, yeah thank you, uh, Ashkan, for the update and you know the hard work and, and hiring folks. I know it's not easy to to do do all this work uh, just by yourself for the most part. Um, so glad we have some more people on. And yeah, again, support the timeline. And you know, for for folks um, <clears throat> who don't know, you know, this this rulemaking process, you know, is has a lot of very sticky issues. So you know, more time for the informational gathering is really important for us to come up with good rules. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Additional comments or questions from the board? Yes, Ms. Sierra. Yes, thank you. Um, so I too um, support this plan. I think it's great. I think that it really um, it's the right balance because as Mr. Lay was saying, we were dealing and you know facing you know some decisions on, on a wide variety of very complex issues. And um, really like the fact that we're gonna have these informational hearings and the stakeholder hearings. Um, so I think it's gonna um, really put us in the best position to make really good decisions. So thank you. And um, I just also wanna thank you and Yvonne and Brian and all the, and the staff and all the agencies that are helping us. I just think that you've made a great deal of progress. I think it's really terrific um, all that has happened in the last, you know, couple of months. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Mr. Thompson. Uh, one, I want to echo what um, Board Member Lay and Board Member Sierra said. You know, the acceleration of our processes, both in you know the administrative and the hiring and the rulemaking uh, since you came on board, uh, has really been remarkable, and I appreciate kind of your clarity of, of thought and your ability to, to move those things in, in parallel. Um, that's given the, that there's only so many hours in a day, uh, you, you clearly are extraordinarily efficient in your use of time because uh, you're, you're marching, marching this agency forward in an impressive fashion. So thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up if this is an appropriate time uh, is if you could say a little bit about the mechanics of the informational hearings and the kind of options uh, that are available to the board. Um, we had talked about this in the process subcommittee, but I think it merits probably a broader discussion of what the board's preference is um, among the, the mechanical options for receiving information from, from experts in those informational hearings. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Sultani. Happy to answer that. Indeed, we're, we're working through, staff and I are working through the mechanics and you um, heard a little bit about the dynamics earlier this morning in the DCA presentation as we try to figure out really the length. So I'll, I'll preface and say we have a good guidance on the topics and the experts based on the comments we receive, based on the questions that come up in subcommittees and really based on the topics that the rulemaking subcommittee previously set, set out for us for the subcommittee. So we kind of know what we need input on or explanation of even uh, to, to explain it. The key piece that I'm trying to ascertain is what's the best format as this will be very dense, multiple day um, uh, meetings and workshops. And so how should we plan to schedule that? Should we, you know, one, one version is that the board attends for if it's a multi-day event for the entirety of that time. Uh, as a board meeting, uh, and that has benefits, of course, because the board can interact with the um, presenters, with the experts, and ask questions directly, but it does also occupy quite a lot of time. The other is that, that it can be run as an informational hearing, typically where staff drives the panels and the, the expert questions, receives that input based on the board's input, based on the, the board's questions, but the board doesn't need to necessarily be present and interacting with the experts directly. And so those are some of the decisions we're trying to uh, put forth, both in terms of for the instructive hearings, the first set of hearings, and then for the second set of the stakeholder hearings. There's also the question of venue and format. Um, the current Bagley Keen exemptions that allow us to operate remotely are extended through March. So our intention is for the instructive hearings to operate remotely there is a chance that the um, stakeholder hearings might then need to take place in person, depending on the update of, the, of those rules. 
and the question of size of venue and preparing for those venue is also uh, something to consider. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Ms. De La Torre? Thank you. I also want to echo the um, comments that were made before. Um, the way in which we're functioning is quickly accelerating, and I expect that this will continue, which is uh, really good news. Um, in terms of the feedback that Mr. Sultani just provided, I just wanted to share with the um, executive director that from my perspective, um, the if, if we could create a space in this process whereby the subcommittees that are working on a specific rules can interact with the rest of the board. Um, that to me will be kind of the communication that has more value versus necessarily asking questions. We as board members or me as a board member asking questions from experts, because I feel that if I have questions, I can direct them to the executive director or to the staff and they can be asked an answer and I can get that feedback through maybe if it's a recording or, or, or a memo. Um, so I just wanted to express my preference um, as it might be helpful to, to make those determinations. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Mr. Sultani, did you want to respond or? Um, I also was hoping to state a preference and I don't know what that will mean after March 31st, which is that um, as so far as possible, that the um, instructive hearings so the public can benefit from them and especially the stakeholder hearings are accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, if it is the case that remote meetings are most accessible and there's a way to do that and comply with Bag McKean, that would be my preference. Um, and either way, uh, whatever, the, whatever is allowed um, as, uh, if we can make them as accessible as possible to a broad swath of people, um, the better, in my view. Mr. Thompson? Um, thank you. The, I agree with you. Both of these, all of these hearings need to be as accessible as possible to a broad array of stakeholders. So that whatever mechanisms we can employ to make them, most available, I think it would be um, in service of our mission of, of public education. Um, one, I want to just follow up on the, the question to the executive director, but also to solicit the, the views of the board and, and board member De La Torre, I think provided her input. Let me state this and, and, and the executive director can correct me if I get it wrong. Um, for the informational hearings with experts, for the board members to interact with the experts and ask questions would require maintenance of a quorum at all times and a, and a noticed board meeting versus if the staff do the questioning and, and board questions flow through the staff would, would not require maintenance of a quorum. Is that the functional difference there? And so I guess the question, well, go ahead. I'll let uh, uh, Brian or Malad answer to the Bagley Keen piece, but based on the um, the kind of the, the thresholds, I think are whether the the majority of the board will be in attendance, and at which point it will be a noticed board meeting. So the, the likelihood is that we will do them as a noticed board meeting just to be on the safe side, so that the board can participate. And then the question of quorum, it's it's more of a question of really format of do we how do we expect if the board members to Ms. De La Torre's point one to interact and, and deliberate on an issue uh, potentially, how we structure that, whether that occurs as part of the interaction or you know, following the interaction with experts or a separate meeting, et cetera. I do right. think, you know, I, I, I recognize the desire to share knowledge among the board and deliberate what you just, um, you know, what you've heard from experts and what the issues that are raised for you. I'm just trying to figure out how to be mindful of, you know, if there's two days of meetings, do we have you all come in at certain points of those meetings to deliberate? Do we schedule a separate meeting to deliberate? Do we do it 
immediately after one of the panels. And then it's, and there's also some nuance with regards to timing. Since we can't put hard time caps on, on things, these discussions can go on and public comment can, can go on. It's just kind of a schedule. It's more of a logistics and schedule question, but I'm um, thankful to receive the input of like what the preferences are so we can try to accommodate. Um, yeah. Brian, did you want to weigh in on quorum or chair, chairperson, did you want to weigh in on quorum? I was just going to point out that if, if we have a majority of the board present, as you've pointed out, Ashkan, procedurally, it would have to be a notice um, uh, board meeting, um, especially if there's going to be some deliberation uh, between board members. It has to be with respect to a noticed meeting with an agenda and all of those other issues. And so um, those are all things that Ashkan's taken into consideration as he structures um, how the sessions are going to be conducted so that we can have the most meaningful input as possible. Thank you, Mr. Soublay. Additional comments or questions from the board? Yes, Ms. Sierra. Thank you. Um, you know, just thinking about the earlier presentation um, today, which was very helpful on this point, and some of the experience that DCA has had um, on working with very complex regulations. And the thing that struck me is that you know, since we have so, uh, uh, you know, a broad um, array of topics, what um, seems to me, if it would work with timing is having, it might be, you know, kind of some, we may have some longer meetings, but some focus meetings on a particular topics may be very helpful. And kind of initially as thinking through this, while, you know, maybe we do some deliberations right after, but I think what may also be very helpful is giving all of us some time to think through it after you know, listening to um, the information we're receiving from the experts and academics to really think through it. And then we may need to be meeting, you know, numerous times, you know, again, with the, with the thought that we have to try to be as efficient as possible. So, you know, it's, it's going to be um, a mix, I expect, of how um, we can best do this. But I just think, you know, again, coming from my perspective on some topics, maybe having some more focused meetings on a particular topic or two, rather than like three days of many topics, you know, may be more helpful. So. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. That's helpful feedback, if I may um, respond. Uh, Wait. So um, indeed, so I'll, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, we're, we're trying to balance kind of multiple events and multiple notices with staff constraints is the only challenge is there's just, um, there's some economies of scale with doing them together, but we may be able to structure them. And this is again, what I have in the back of my head where, you know, at least certain portions of the day are structured around a certain topic. And then board members interested in that topic can attend those portions. So panels on, you know, particular subcommittee topic or issues of one subcommittee one day and one subcommittee another day, just so we can allow some flexibility. But that does speak to the question that was raised earlier by um, by uh, board member Thompson around whether we need quorum to do the deliberations or whether we try to structure it so that we don't need quorum for those different subcommittees, but then maybe we have a session after. I'll also add that it was in, you know, a lot of my, uh, a, lot, a lot of this is informed by talking to other boards, but also Brian has had a tremendous amount of rulemaking experience. The, you know, typically what um, DOJ did and, and what DMV did, for example, for their autonomous vehicle rulemaking, if I understand correctly, Brian, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, effectively staff digested or helped digest the material for the board in terms of, you know, the meetings were transcribed, the comments were presented in the form that was essentially presenting the issues and pretend, presenting the topics to the board. They will also all be recorded and available to the board to watch the whole thing, but you will see, you know, you will receive a Cliff Notes version effectively that will help you inform uh, some of those topics, those decision points for you. That was the intent of having these. And those will, of course, inform our initial rulemaking package too, though. The whole point of it is to make sure that we're well informed and we've received um, expert and stakeholder input on uh, in advance of our, you know, of our NOPA. Thank you, Mr. Soltani. Ms. De La Torre. I just wanted to mention that the suggestion that Mr. Sultani just made of um, having staff help digest the information, the uh, suggestion that was made by uh, 
um, board member Sierra of giving us some time to to think through things before having a conversation seemed very very useful to me. I don't necessarily feel the need to be present uh, during the um, uh, testimony of experts uh, because there's been a very good communication with the staff in terms of enabling um, at least me and I imagine other board members to uh, suggest questions for that for that session. Um, I, um, I'm not sure if um, other members feel um, the same way, but I thought that sharing that feedback will be helpful uh, for Mr. Sultani to try to accommodate all of the different um, priorities that he's trying to make sure he um, uh, achieves. Uh, uh, my former comment about allowing for some um, form of discussion between specific subcommittees and the rest of the um, members of the board is aligned with uh, Mrs. Sierra's um, idea of being something that is topic specific. There, there could be a need for um, subcommittees to just gather some um, thoughts from, from the rest of the board on specific topics. Um, and I'm agnostic as to whether that is part of the larger meeting or something separate. Um, I understand that the logistics are, are complicated and um, the uh, resources in terms of his staff are, are limited. So I leave that to Mr. Sultani to help us um, identify the best format. Thank you, Ms. Salatori. Additional comments or questions from board members? Yes, Mr. Thompson. Sorry, I just wanted to, to kind of put a bow around this, the question, which was, and it, it seems like we're, we're headed towards a consensus that two separate things. One is deliberation, which I would set to the side, but the other is the, the format of the hearing and how the board, inter board and the staff interact with, with experts. Um, I don't have a strong feeling. My inclination generally is to be able to be, be able to ask questions, um, but I'm totally open to the format that, that I think we're leaning towards, which is board member questions flowing through the staff and see how that goes. And then if we need to check and adjust down the road. Um, but just wanted to kind of, to, since I posed the question, um, make sure that I'm correctly uh, interpreting the, the direction of the, of the rest of the board and, and, and kind of tie off that conversation. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your careful listening to the comments of the board. That was also my understanding, and I don't think we need to have any formal but if we, uh, indication, but if people just nod <laughs> or not, um, that's great. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Additional comments or questions from the board? Uh, yes, Mr. Soltani. Yeah, and I'll just respond uh, to Mr. Thompson's comment and the whole board is my intent, you know, th this this procedure is really designed, or this process is really designed to inform staff and the board. And so my intent is in advance of these, you know, really to work with the board and I really implore you to give me the issues and topics you need further um, input on. I've, I've already ascertained some of these in our subcommittees, but if you've seen the 900 pages of comments we've received, there's a diverse set of um, viewpoints that I wanna make sure that the board is informed about in through both the informational hearings as well as the stakeholder engagements. Um, so please give me, you know, I, I, I want to solicit that. I'll continue to do that through both the subcommittees, but individual board members that aren't on particular subject matter subcommittees, but want to provide uh, or, or have questions about, uh, you know, about topics, please share those with me. And I will say just one final point is that, you know, the goal is to have a lead in it. In, um, I don't know if I was clear in the rulemaking timeline, but we will also be having formal procedural hearings once we engage in rulemaking. So there'll be ample chance to engage with the same stakeholders and experts through the formal process as well. This is kind of the lead up to at least make a good guess as to where we wanna be on topics. Um, but I also stress that even in that lead up in the preliminary activities, I intend to have two sets, right? So one is, um, and, and so there's no reason why both sets have to operate under the same rules. One, one set could be, you know, um, purely staff driven and the second set could have deliberation at some point um, by the board if we chose to, or, you know, once the, um, you know, once the materials have been presented to the board, the memos have been presented, we could schedule deliberation around those memos as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani. 
additional comments or questions from the board? In that case, I would simply like to reiterate the thanks um, to the executive director for all of his work at several different levels um, in building the organization and putting us in a good position um, to be able to engage in a successful rulemaking. Um, I will say, I know that the, the budget, the BCP is also a great deal of work and it's been extraordinarily positive to see the staffing of the agency be built um, steadily uh, and to watch um, all of the, to see all of the things that that um, can, allows us to do that we weren't able to do before. So thank you very much for your very competent and energetic leadership so far. Um, it is much appreciated. And Thank with you. that, um, uh, Ms. Hurtado, uh, is there any comment from the public? Uh, yes, we do have two commenters waiting. Um, I'll go ahead and um, prepare the first one. Thank you. Jennifer Sheridan, uh, you have three minutes to speak. Unmute your mic, Jennifer. Ms. Hurtado, perhaps uh, you need to unmute for her? Uh, no, it's not allowing me to. It, it says to ask her to do it. Oh, all right. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Thank you. J1, you now have three minutes to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great, thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to recognize the, the tremendous amount of work that the board and the staff has done. I, I think uh, it is definitely worth uh, underlining uh, the comment earlier that, that we're building the car while we drive it. Uh, having said that, I know that several of us who have been listening uh, to the board meeting, um, we, we would like to um, see if you can comment on the fact that the rulemaking will likely not complete by the end of the year. So uh, is there any thought in to pushing perhaps the enforcement date, which currently is set at July 1, 2023. Thank you very much, Ms. Serrato, for your comments. Um, we will take it under advisement. Ms. Hurtado, are there additional comments? Uh, yes, the next commenter is Edwin. You now have three minutes to speak. Oh, hold on. Let me see if I can do this. I'm going to. OK, Mr. Lombard, you have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, my name is Edwin Lombard. I am uh, a uh, political consultant for the African American Chamber of Commerce, the Black Business Association, and the Association of Black Pastors throughout the state of California. And as a leader in the minority owned businesses, my time and energies are dedicated to creating a predictable and a positive business environment for to help small businesses stay on their feet and thrive in the state of California. I would like to reiterate some of the key points that I mentioned in November uh, in public comment. First, uh, Proposition 424 is an extremely complicated body of, and of law with significant impact on consumers and businesses. While the initiative focuses on consumer rights, uh, Proposition 24 sought balance. The rights of consumers and the responsibilities of businesses should be implemented with the goal of strengthening consumer privacy while giving attention to the impact on business and innovation. While many of, of uh, may think that the CPPA's forthcoming regulation may only impact large companies, I'm here today to let you know it also affects small businesses and the consumers that they serve. As you know, COVID had an, an irre irreversible impact on our small businesses, and we're just now starting to recover from it. And we don't need any additional regulation that is going Oh, 
it looks like Mr. Lombard froze. Mr. Lombard, um, have we lost your Not connection? To rush the regulation and that you consider the effect that it's going to have on our small businesses as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lombard. Okay, the next speaker is uh, B. Kelly. You now have three minutes to speak. Please unmute your mic. Thank you. Um, and congratulations, Lydia. Um, my name is Bennett Kelly, and I am the founder of the Internet Law Center um, in Santa Monica, California. And I have worked with clients and even the state bar on internet and privacy issues for over two decades now. Um, your work and the decisions that you make here um, as a board will have far reaching consequences for the business, business and consumers throughout California and beyond. According to a recent study released by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, it is estimated that the CCPA could cost California's economy upwards of $46 million annually and that California small businesses will bear 9 billion of in-state costs. And I've seen that firsthand in the small businesses I've worked with. As you proceed with your work, I urge the board to think carefully about the cost of compliance and take into account how your enforcement will impact the business community throughout California, particularly small businesses, which are the greatest job generators. In addition, based on my experience in interacting um, to date on CalCPA, I ask that you not take actions that would impair a business's ability to offer privacy remedies for citizens from states other than California. Um, that's all. Thank you very much and uh, good luck to you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Okay, our next speaker is Johannes Ernst. You now have three minutes to speak. Please unmute your mic. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good. My name is Johannes Ernst. Uh, I am an entrepreneur building technology that leverage these new data rights that California consumers have been getting. Uh, for valuable new products and services that weren't possible before. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to make a comment. I have only a very quick question. Um, how are you planning to select the experts that you will invite to the series of events that you're planning? Uh, obviously, as we already hear in the comments uh, before, there is all sorts of, um, there's all sorts of points of view. Uh, and it is, of course, very important that you uh, reflect a very broad um, uh, set of constituents. Uh, so any comments you have about the selection of those uh, experts and what the process is for doing so would be uh, appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ernst. Uh, I would say please keep an eye on our website um, for the process for the informational hearings. Um, and thank you for your question and for your comment. Ms. Hurtado, um, Ms. Sheridan still has her hand up. Do you want to try her again? I'm, yeah, I'm going to try her again. Jennifer Sheridan, you now have three minutes to speak. Please unmute your mic. I'm going to try promoting her like I did um, for the other person and see if that helps. Ms. Sheridan, are you there? All right, thank you, Ms. Hurtado. Ms. Sheridan, if you can hear us and we cannot hear you, um, we will have the opportunity for additional public comment later in the meeting. Um, so if you're having some technical difficulties, uh, it may be possible to try another method of joining the meeting um, and you can offer your public comments at that time. Um, Ms. Hurtado, are there additional um, requests for public comment? Uh, yes, there is one more, Nicole Smith. Uh, you have been unmuted. Now you have three minutes to speak. 
Great. Thank you so much. This is Nicole Smith. I'm a privacy attorney for ServiceNow, a Silicon Valley tech company. And I wanted to, first of all, thank everyone involved for the tremendous amount of work involved in getting this agency up and running. It was really great to hear the progress that has just been done in the last quarter and a half. Um, that said, I also wanted to thank you for the format, um, making it remotely accessible. Of course, now we're all in COVID, but it, I encourage this format going forward. Um, it really makes it easy for us to attend the meetings, especially those of us who are working at tech companies, advising them from a privacy perspective, um, rather than having to commute to Sacramento uh, for an in-person meeting, which is often the case. We don't have bandwidth in our schedule to do that, but we, it's much easier for us to jump in the call. So to the extent that it remains feasible going forward, I would greatly encourage this because I find it very useful. Um, and other than that, in terms of rules prom promulgation, which was touched upon earlier, um, to the extent that we can keep that as a constant agenda item, because this is something that the privacy sector, you know, the attorneys who are advising companies, et cetera, we're keeping a close eye on that. And from an internal perspective, it takes a lot of planning in advance to get companies compliant because of course, we are just the receptors of the information. Then we need to go and meet with internal stakeholders in order to get them compliant. So there's a lot of um, runway that, it, that we need in order to get from learning about the final rules to um, final compliance internally. So to the extent that we can always keep that as an agenda item and uh, get any advanced copies ahead of the agenda so that we can give feedback, commentary, et cetera, greatly appreciated. That would just be wonderful. And other than that, I wish to thank you all for your hard work. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Ms. Hurtado, is there additional public comment on this item? Uh, no, she was our last speaker. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, thank you again, Executive Director Sultani, uh, for all your work and for your thorough report to the board members for a robust and helpful discussion and to the members of the public um, for your helpful for participation. It is now 1215, um, but I think we will go ahead and continue with the um, agenda items rather than breaking for lunch. So with that, we'll go to agenda item number five, proceeding with that agenda item, um, it, it, excuse me, which is, excuse, sorry, maybe I should take a break. Um, let me pause and back up here. We will now proceed with agenda item number five, which is approval of the November 15th, 2021 meeting minutes. As I've mentioned in the last meeting, staffing shortages have resulted in some tasks requiring extra time, but we are catching up. And I want to um, extend my sincere thanks to the Office of the Attorney General for helping provide this service currently, and especially to Ms. Susan Wayland and Ms. Rachel Frazier for their work. Um, I would also like to draw the public's attention to the fact that um, all recordings of all meetings to date are available on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can always go there uh, in order to watch the meetings later. Uh, with that, um, thank you to the board members for your attention to the November 15th, 2021 meeting minutes. Um, are there any additions or corrections from board members? Thank you very much. Um, seeing none, are there any comments from members of the public? There are no comments at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. <clears throat> May I have a motion to approve the November 15th, 2021 California Privacy Protection Agency Board meeting minutes as submitted? Happy to make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. 
I have a motion and a second to approve the November 15th, 2021 California Privacy Protection Agency board meeting minutes as submitted. Ms. Hurtado, would you please perform the roll call vote? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. <clears throat> and Ms. Urban? Aye. We have five ayes and zero nays. Thank you, Ms. De La, excuse me, thank you, Ms. Hurtado and members of the board. Um, on a vote of five to zero, the November 15th, 2021 minutes are approved as submitted. Um, I will work with the executive director to have the final minutes um, uh, put up on our website um, so that they are available to the public. Thank you, everyone. We will now turn to agenda item number six, in which we invite public comment on items that are not on the agenda. Before we proceed with this public comment, um, please note that the only action the board can take is to listen to comments and consider whether it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Though this may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure that the rules of the Bad Bikin Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising either the commenter's goals or the board's mission. Um, with that reminder in place, um, may I ask if there are any members of the public who would like to comment? There are no comments at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. We will now then turn to agenda item number seven, uh, which is a discussion of future agenda items. This is an opportunity um, for the board and then the public uh, to suggest uh, items for future agendas. I have a list um, of items, uh, some of which I've collected from previous meetings um, and some of which um, uh, um, I have heard about today. Uh, one is um, a focus um, which we will need to move to on rulemaking substance. Um, and I um, gather the executive director is attentive to that. We had some discussion uh, earlier about uh, when the board might deliberate and discuss amongst, uh, among ourselves various um, aspects of the rulemaking and perhaps what we hear from experts. So I have that um, on the list as a general matter. Um, we do have um, input on one um, hiring a decision by the executive director, if you recall back to November 15th, um, there um, will at some point be a closed session item on the agenda to give the executive director input on the deputy director of public awareness, um, uh, for, excuse me, for public affairs. Um, we have talked about additional trainings and tutorials like the one that we had this morning. If there are any of the board members that specifically would find useful, um, please let the executive director no, um, we will of course have additional um, reports from the executive director um, and reports from subcommittees as necessary. So that's my running list that I am keeping. Um, are there additional items from board members? Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you, Mrs. Urban. Um, I would like to suggest for a future board meeting to set aside some time to have a conversation about the priorities in a more concrete way that we are setting for the agency this year. Obviously, there is a legal mandate on what the agencies are performing. It's in um, section 1719, 199.40 of the law. And a major, um, you know, a, a major area that re uh, requires our attention is rulemaking. But it's not the only um, goal that we are set to achieve as an agency. And I think it will be beneficial to set some time to just make those more abstract goals more concrete and identify specific items. Um, for example, we had conversations in the past about diversity and inclusion for our staff. Do we wanna set goals for diversity and inclusion for this year and what those goals might be? that kind of more um, concrete 
conversation, I think will be really helpful for us to um, direct our um, resources and also for our executive director to be able to um, be aware of our um, priorities so that he can um, organize uh, the resources accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Elifore. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I was um, you know, going through the ethics training a while back, and then I remember um, a section on conflict of interest, and I realized we do not have a conflicts of interest policy uh, that we've adopted as far as I know. Um, so perhaps it would be good to, for a future meeting, um, you know, look at examples, get a memo of certain policies in other agencies, and then adopt one ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Any additional items from board members? All right, thank you very much. I've noted down um, the items that were mentioned um, today. And uh, we'll ask if there's any public comment. Uh, there is one uh, commenter waiting, uh, Robert Meissen. Uh, you are now unmuted. You may now speak, you have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. My, my uh, boss, Luis Rodriguez, was trying to make public comment earlier, but uh, had to hop off and wanted me to make a statement on behalf of his business in Los Angeles. I'm gonna read it here. Um, this is on behalf again of Luis Rodriguez. It says, my name is Luis Rodriguez. I own a small business located in Los Angeles that relies on technology to operate. I utilize the internet regularly to reach and serve my customers. As a small business owner, I appreciate the need for consumer privacy protections, and I want my customers to know that their data is safe when they hire me for a job. At the same time, I am concerned with the cost of compliance, and I worry that decisions by this board may lead to unintended consequences. Please avoid making any decisions that could impact access and affordability for small businesses and consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maison. Are there any additional public comments, Mr. Tato? Not at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Ricardo. Um, with that, we will um, move on to agenda item number eight, which is our final agenda item, adjournment. I would like to thank everyone, um, all the board members, um, the executive director, Mr. Souble, Mr. Dalju, and other staff um, who have contributed to this meeting for their contributions, and especially thank members of the public for their contributions to this meeting and to the board's work. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Ms. Hurtado, I have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. Could you please conduct the roll call vote? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Lay? Aye. Ms. Sierra? Aye. Ms. De La Torre? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Ms. Urban? Aye. You have five ayes and zero nays. Thank you very much, Ms. Hurtado. The motion has been approved by a vote of five to zero. And this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is hereby adjourned at 12.26 PM. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>